Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MIF++ seminar. Today, Matthew Bright will uh, practice two talks for the IUCR Congress in Melbourne, Australia, next week. And first, Matt will start from uh, a 15-minute presentation on continuous maps of two-dimensional lattices. Over to you, Matt, please. Thanks. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do uh, for, for, for this talk is hopefully this, yeah, um, is to start with an extremely informal picture of what we're trying to do. And the idea is I'll gradually show how we've formally gone about this in a relatively simple but still non-trivial case. Uh, so the idea generally of our group is that since the properties of materials are dictated in large part by the geometric arrangements of their atoms, we want to find some way of comparing any two structures that kind of works in the way you'd intuitively want it to work. We should be able to tell here uh, generally that the two structures on the right here are quite similar, but that the two, the, the, but they are both very different from the structure of the left on the left. And the idea, uh, the general approach here is to mathematically map these rather complex structures to some sort of nice tractable space that we can that we can work with. Why are we doing this? Well, uh, how you define, why are we doing this for crystals? How you define the geometry of a crystal is a very old question. It has an extremely established answer in terms of things like Brave glasses, space groups, and so forth. But now we've got millions of, of crystal structures that we can work with across loads of databases. So these uh, these discrete classifications are perhaps now a little a, a little more a little coarse a coarser than we need. Also, we use crystal structure prediction to generate structures. Uh, now, um, hundreds of thousands of them in experiments. How do we know how many are very similar to each other? Since lots of predictive and machine learning analytics rely on measures of similarities of structures, it's important to get these things right. And since we're mathematicians, we've been trying to approach this problem from the ground up, probing the maths of the very simplest periodic geometries to discover the challenges of making a continuous descriptor of more complex ones. And this beast here is about as simple as you can get. It's a two-dimensional lattice, really just an infinite set of integer combinations of a pair of vectors in two-dimensional space. And we've known for a long time how to classify these into groups. We can get it down to four point groups, so automorphism groups of the lattice that don't include translations, that have the symmetries of a parallelogram, a rectangle, a square, or a hexagon, C2, D2, D4, or D6. We can split that further um, into Brave types by uh, deciding whether or not the rectangular lattice is centered. And if we want to go really granular, we can use kind of Niggy's characters uh, to split centered rectangular lattices into two kinds, depending on the relationships, uh, uh, relationships of the parameters of their reduced basis. So really, that's about six discrete classes, which is still fairly coarse if we want to um, categorize things continuously. OK, so we want to find some way of mapping a lattice to some space we can work with. What data do we need to do that? Well, perhaps we can start with the basis vectors, the description I've already given you. It's a long way from Liverpool to Melbourne, but my talk has thankfully survived the trip. Imagine we're in Melbourne now. And the reason for that is that modulo really hard bangs and it's sort of falling out of the plane and stuff. Uh, all of the materials that help me store it on my hard drive stay the same if I move them about. The point is that any description I make definitely shouldn't change as a result of that sort of movement. So just a list of vectors won't do because Obviously, it's uh, it's pretty arbitrary. Moving things about, rotating them, these are all examples of what we call isometries because they keep the distance between any two points the same. In fact, the only other isometry is reflection, but we might want to distinguish that because as chemists know, sometimes reflection changes the properties of things. Okay, so let's try another obvious answer. Just use the parameters, lengths, angles, the inner product. They don't change under those sorts of transformations, except that, as we know, even this isn't fixed, because I can describe exactly the same lattice in loads of different ways, an infinite number, in fact, as I'm doing here with this, this arbitrary lattice I've se selected. I can keep one vector fixed and pick, pick any number, pick an infinite number. Uh, that will uh, generate the same lattice. 
But we've got an obvious answer for that as well that we all know, which is using uh, what, what crystallographers, mathematical crystallographers call a reduction. We can, uh, Lagrange reduction, Minkowski, Berger, sets of um, inequalities that constrain us to pick one particular uh, lattice basis. In two dimensions, a lot of the, the different reductions kind of come down to the same uh, the same pair of vectors, but I've given an example of, of the one Neely used in, in his very early papers in the 1920s here. And yes, that will give us a unique description, but here's where we hit the hard part, which is to do with continuity. Remember, we want to be able to compare things continuously. We want small variations to lead to small changes in whatever space we're mapping these structures to, and large variations to lead to large changes. But, and in fact, you can prove this for any reduction, uh, this schematic illustrates why that's a problem, uh, why, why using any reduction is a problem. As I gradually change, uh, as I gradually deform this lattice here, and as it passes through a higher symmetry uh, position. Um, any reduction I choose, in this case, again, I've chosen the reduction and force an obtuse angle basis, or uh, based with an obtuse angle here, will suddenly change discontinuously, and therefore its parameters will change discontinuously, because it's going to choose a different, uh, it's, it's going to suddenly choose a, a different pair of basis vectors. So that's, uh, that's where we come up against the problem. Now, how we've cho chosen to solve this by, is by revisiting a less well-known reduced basis called the Zelling reduction. So Zelling uh, augmented his lattice basis with a super base vector, which is just the negative sum of all the basis vectors. And he defined a super basis Zelling reduced if all of those vectors had obtuse angles between them, that is, if their inner products were negative. And uh, later on, Delone, or Delaunay if you prefer, proved that in two and three dimensions at least, every lattice does in fact have an obtuse super base. We can, we can, we can always construct one and in fact more of these things. But the really good thing for us in two dimensions dimensions is that you can formally prove, and we have, that in, the, in two dimensions, the obtuse super base is unique to a lattice uh, up to rigid motion, but not unique up to isometry, because if I have a rectangular lattice, I can make several obtuse superbases. If I have a primitive rectangular lattice, I can make several obtuse superbases that are reflections of each other. But even better than this, not only is the descriptor um, unique up to isometry in two dimensions, but we can get continuity out of it. Um, now, the mathematics showing this is really quite non-trivial. This is, this is kind of the hard part. Um, and, and actually just defining what you mean by continuous leads you down some alleyways. Uh, so um, I, would, um, if you, I would ask you to trust me here. I've given a schematic illustration. If you would like the proofs, they're in these, uh, the references to this talk. Uh, but essentially what we're illustrating here um, is that as I, again, as I slowly um, deform this, this, this two-dimensional lattice, uh, if I pick any pair of vectors, they're going to appear to change discontinuously as they did before. But if we keep all, if we keep track of all three vectors, what we see is in fact happening in any, in any given pair is that one of them is being replaced by the third continuously changing vector that we keep track of. So really what's changing is the order in which we're looking at these vectors. Uh, their, their, their parameters are changing continuously. So we want to take something that arises from the parameters of all three and is invariant under permutation, which obviously you simply order, um, you take the, uh, the order triple perhaps of the inner product. The inner product is built up from length and angle, so it's not, so it's isometry invariant. Um, and, uh, and we can, and if we put them in order, it's kind of impermeable. It, it doesn't notice permutations. It stays where it is. So that's an isometry invariant. Um, and we use the, uh, we use the square root of the inner product or the square root of the negative inner product, since obviously this, uh, if they're obtuse, the inner products are negative. So we use the square roots of the negative product, which is a non-negative number greater than or equal to zero. Um, and that really, uh, the useful thing there is it takes your, it means that your uh, units of these, of these parameters, these three parameters are the units of the lengths of the original vector. So angstroms, if you're a, if you're a crystallographer, um, say. Um, and that gives us our root form. Uh, no more and no less than these, these pairwise ordered inner products. And the fact that it's a complete invariant, it is a complete invariant, means that not only is every lattice mapped to an ordered triple, but that any ordered triple maps back to a lattice uniquely. We can uniquely describe them in two ways. So we have our space. It gives you a space for free. In fact, a cone in three dimensions. And even better, the discrete classification that we understand from the cone uh, falls out nicely as, as, um, as subspaces. 
of the space of lattices, the intersection of, of various planes in three dimensions with the cone. So for example, uh, if you have a primitive rectangular lattice, then one of your angles is going to be 90 degrees. Uh, so your smallest root product, your smallest R12 is going to be zero, and that's going to live on, on this plane here. Um, or in some senses, there, 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 there is an empty set here uh, where, uh, strictly speaking, all three, um, uh, this, this strictly speaking means that everything is zero, but uh, we want to, uh, that's, that would be an empty set, no lattices mapped there, um, but all lattices map to somewhere else in this space. Um, and if you, that's rather hard to visualize in three dimensions, so um, we want, might maybe want to put it down to two dimensions, uh, which we can do by ignoring scaling. So uh, if we just care about the geometry, we don't care about scaling, uh, we, can, we can map this down. And this is the mathematics of this uh, gets us to a map in a right angle triangle. All we're really doing really is mapping some vertical slice through, through this, this cone. Uh, but again, the same thing happens. The space is a triangle now up to similarity. The boundaries and intersections of the boundaries are where higher symmetry lattices, uh, higher symmetry lattices exist. Um, so, so that's kind of an easier visualization. How do we cope with mirror reflections, if we care about that? Well, uh, you can show that if we order the root products, that means you're ordering the vectors by length of the obtuse superbase. We can take the sine of a lattice as either zero uh, or the sine of the determinant of the lattice, which has the two shortest vectors as its columns. And that's an invariant up to, up to rigid motion rather than isometry. So we can, we can differentiate lattices, which are mirror images of each other. Um, and, that, and if we just append the sign to the root invariant, then we go from an isometry invariant to, a, uh, uh, to a, uh, an invariant up to rigid motion. How do we visualize that? Well, we kind of pull a little topological trick here. What we do is we take a second copy of the space and we glue it to the original copy of the space along, high, along a space containing one of these subspaces containing higher symmetry lattices, uh, where the chirality is always going to be equal to zero. Uh, so uh, we either in the in the three dimensional case we have a doubled cone. We simply uh, map another copy of the cone, and in the two dimensional case uh, we have another copy of the triangle across the diagonal. And this hopefully illustrates what you have here. Then you have this continuous space, and if I kind of move in a diagonal path along uh, across this border, um, I deform this lattice uh, through a higher symmetry, through a, uh, a centered rectangular lattice and back into uh, its mirror image here um, in, the, in, in the square. So that's kind of schematically illustrates what's going on. If that's a bit awkward, we can do slightly better by mapping negative, by mapping uh, two copies of the triangle or mapping uh, a copy of the triangle containing, neg containing negative sign lattices and the copy containing uh, positive sign lattices to two hemispheres and glue them together on a sphere. Um, since the top the, top, the topology is the same, basically you can you 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 can uh, use a, a triangular space with a, with an empty point as you do here, or you can you can have a punctured sphere um, as you do here, and this maybe is slightly more uh, more intuitive. So let's kind of show what uh, what what we can practically do with this in two dimensions. Uh, for example, we want to see what kind of two dimensional lattices can naturally form in real life. So we take the Cambridge crystallographic structural database. We take sort of eight hundred and sixty thousand structures, and we uh, with three dimensional lattices, and we pull two dimensional lattices out of them. Okay, um, and uh, we can extract thereby sort of um, about three million uh, such lattices. That's how quick this computation is. And here's the map of that in our in our space. Uh, now you'd expect, uh, since since most of these lattices are going to have at least two of their the two dimensional lattices extracted as higher symmetries, it's very dense on the borders here. You're seeing a lot of uh, of, 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 primi of primitive and centered rectangular lattices. Um, so uh, so that sort of um, uh, yeah. Um, that's that's the sort of space that you can see, and um, but the, more naturally, if you take the kind of middle bit, so this is this is where lattices don't have any symmetry. Uh, it's quite nicely filled. There appear to be fewer 
negative sign than positive sign lattices, but this is due to the fact that uh, um, lattice lengths are ordered. So when we pull them out, so this is another artificial effect. But what isn't artificial is the smooth and continuous filling of each half of the space. Uh, so that that kind of tells us that uh, that in fact nature does adopt two D lattices in nature do adopt. Uh, not all possible configurations. As we go out to this corner, lattices become essentially infinitely long and thin, and uh, and therefore unphysical. Uh, but the um, the middle. Uh, but other than that, uh, things are nicely filled. Although they do prefer to be closer to the point representing hexagonal lattices. And this is what it looks like at the sphere. It looks like at the sphere where we've kind of shown you where hexagonal lattices live. Again, you can see that density, but you can see it all nicely. Both hemispheres. This is the northern and southern hemisphere, so positive and negative lattices. Negative lattices less dense, but again, with a sort of um, it's thinning out towards the the point where lattices become very long and thin, and and it's non-physical. Uh, but again, you can see um, a really uh, a kind of good filling of the space there. Which, uh, uh, which, which is at least intriguing. If that seems a bit artificial, we can take monoclinic lattices, which are just layers of two-dimensional lattices with an orthogonal vector to each layer, uh, separating them. And again, you see the same thing. You see, uh, you see that those those layered lattices, the two-dimensional layered lattices, um, are uh, are filling the space. Uh, quite clearly, or filling the physical, physically meaningful bits of the space, and becoming more dense towards, uh, but becoming more dense towards the point at the top, this vertex here, which represents hexagonal lattices. So lattices sort of want to be highly symmetrical to adopt the the most sort of the most symmetrical configuration, uh, but they can adopt a wide range of them. And the big question is, how do we extend this to three dimensions? Well, the problem we have here is obtuse superfaces aren't quite isometry invariants in three dimensional space. Um, although you can get isometry invariants out of them, you just have to be a little bit more careful about your definitions of, of, of kind of metrics, your definitions of the space. So in summary, uh, any ordered triple is an isometry invariant representation of the lattice. That's the root invariant. And by adding a sign, we can determine the lattice uniquely up to rigid motion. So we indeed do have a mapping of lattices to some mathematically tractable space where we can start to think about distances, which I will in my next talk. And the code for all this and computing any uh, computing any lattice invariants you want out of it is available at my GitHub if you'd, uh, if you'd like to see it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. <clears throat> Um, got a bit. Okay, since uh, the talks are separate, I'll probably stop recording um, for this one. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you.